I think that the, the one common through all the presentations is that everything is changing. Um, access to finance is different for everybody. It's a big challenge for SMEs, and as their advisors, we have to navigate through that challenge. I have some questions here coming in. Um, and the first one here is from Mike. Um, great presentation, Mike. Crowdfunding has to be embraced by the accounting profession fully. What are your thoughts on linking professional accountants to funding portals to ensure that startups have access to the right type of advice? I think that's an excellent idea. I know that in, certainly in Canada and the US, um, the, a lot of the accounting firms, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the big four, are very active with that whole uh, startup ecosystem. They provide a lot of uh, uh, pro bono initial uh, services to help entrepreneurs get their pitch right, to help them put together a good presentation to attract investors. Uh, basically instill some professionalism. So they're playing a very, very active role, and I think that's a huge opportunity for the accounting profession. Yeah. And would it be to benefit um, SMEs or larger enterprises of the big four? Is that the role they're taking, on, or is it just is it the smaller enterprises as well? It, it's, it's both. It's both. It, it's both. Yeah. We, we see... Um, you know, a mix of uh, small to medium and large enterprises, and as well on the accounting side, there are a lot of SMPs, and then there are the, the big four, and they're all very active in it, because I think everybody sees it as a huge opportunity. When you think that the crowd has been excluded from the financing equation, other than companies doing an initial public offering, um, the crowd typically can't invest either through regulations or just, um, the challenge of making the connection with the small company. How does yeah. the crowd find out about it? How is that communicated? So doing that matchmaking and, th and then bringing the crowd in yeah. um, is a huge opportunity okay. because it's been untapped, yeah. totally untapped. It's probably more than 95% of the population has not access to what might be the next Google or Yahoo or whatever. I think it's probably going to be a big player the next 10 years. As you said, Graeme, sitting here, it's very hard to see how the next 10 years is going to evolve uh, from a sourcing finance perspective. Another question here, again from Mike. Uh, portals as stock exchanges, what are the implications of local regulations? Where or which jurisdiction protects the investor, his or that of the issuer? Well, that's, a, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, they, this issue of protecting the investor uh, is, is an interesting one. What does that mean, protect the investor? Um, because we know that the odds of failure are very high. Um, if you're talking about protecting against scams and uh, fraudulent activities, what I found interesting is the, the Australia Small Scale Offerings Board, for example, has operated a crowdfunding platform for a couple of years now. And I met with the CEO who operates that, and he was telling me that they've done 300 deals, 300 companies at the time I spoke to him, which was about a year ago. And he said that they had no fraudulent companies, no scams out of that 300. Failures, yes, but not scams. So I think what's important is to communicate the risks to investors, make sure that they understand that they really are taking a risk. Mm. And, and I think that's how you protect, through good um, yeah. information and risk awareness. Yeah. Okay. People tend to think that a business is infallible and it's going to succeed, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Most companies will fail. Yeah. As you said, it is a gamble. Yes. Um, hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes? yes. Okay. Um, look, I was really interested in what Graham said. I'm also from Australia and I'm his counterpart in the IPA. Um, and I just want to talk about, you talked about banking. Um, I'm really interested what your thoughts are about availability of um, credit and also the cost of credit to small to medium business. You talked a lot about the banks. So would you like to just expand on that piece, perhaps? Well, well our findings in relation to the availability of credit uh, that it's, it's not that difficult in, in our market. You know, as I said, we've got a, a relatively robust mood around the country, so we haven't got the, the jitters from lenders. And the fact that interest rates have come down so significantly over time has also uh, increased people's capacity to repay, which is 
satisfied the banks. Our the experience is that the cost to SMEs in Australia is exorbitant. So the rate of interest and the fees well exceeds the residential and the corporate rate. So an access to credit, even though there is billions of dollars of profit, is very difficult. So it's actually the boutique banks that are offering the credit, but there are decision tools and um, very high interest rates around personal loans and so forth. And also, small businesses have to put up all of their assets, unlike big corporates, et cetera. So they, they actually are finding it very difficult to get funding. So I'm just interested in that view from your banking perspective. Yeah, well, it's, it's not my experience. The, the funding available, availability through uh, residential finance and, and, and real estate security being offered obviously gives access to large amounts of finance, but the um, the other facilities such as even a credit card, which at you know, 21%. Yeah, exactly, yeah. that's what I was about to say. At 19% is not not a lot of money based on the volume of the debt. If, if you had a if you had a housing, it is a lot of money to an SME though. But it, it's not really when you're dealing with a $10,000 debt, say, at an interest rate of 16 or 18%. It's, it's not a fortune and it's not a long-term debt generally. So you, you wouldn't obviously fund your business and your, and your life around credit card debt, but as a short-term fix for some small issue, it's not a bad facility. And the finance of leases and higher purchases are sitting at 7% or so. So that's um, reasonable finance in today's environment and a lot better than what it was a few years ago. And clearly, um, the, the bigger you are, uh, you don't have to give directors guarantees, you get discounts on volume, you've got reputation, you've got all these sorts of things acting in your favour. The bigger you are, the yeah, easier Graham, it is. Yeah, but Graham, SMEs aren't big. And, and I yeah. noticed on your slide you had a lot of branded big corporates. So they, they are struggling actually to get... They do have to put their guarantee up, they do have to put their house up, they can get very high interest rates. So availability is actually... I would actually agree with Kuma. It's very difficult, and globally, uh, uh, SMEs are experiencing issues. So our role is to how do we facilitate a easier access to funds at a at a reasonable rate because they are small businesses and they're finding it very difficult to pay back those rates. So I think that's where we have a real opportunity um, to influence governments, perhaps, and as accountants to look at. Uh, crowdsourcing is a fantastic area, and it's in, actually in the opposition to banks, to be perfectly honest, a paradox, really. So if the banks aren't doing it and the boutique banks are even saying, we're not going to lend unless you've been in business for two years, and as we know, 90% of businesses fail between two years, this is our challenge, and 90% of businesses around the world are small to medium businesses. So we, I don't know if the banks is really the answer, to be honest, at the rates they're offering. So we need to think outside that square. So... I suppose that's the question I'm trying to ask. Is really availability and cost, is, it re is banking really the option? I don't think it is. I think Kumar's raised that. I think I agree with you there, and I think that's why we're talking about crowdfunding and all of that, that what is actually going to evolve in the future, because the global financial crisis nearly put the banks out of business, so they're, they're, they're so risk-averse that, it, 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 that that's the challenge, and that's, let's see what the next 10 years bring. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is George Sado. I'm from ICANN, the Nigeria, um, ICANN, Nigeria. My question goes to uh, Mike. Um, you spoke about, we know a lot of, um, a lot of businesses fail, but those that succeed, you, you seem to, uh, I think you skirted around the fact that um, how do you, how do you, how do you um, give profit back to the investors? But you talked about it as if, all the businesses that succeed are going to get um, bought off because you talked about who, who, uh, if Google buys you off, how do we distribute the profit? Now, how about those that succeed and are not necessarily bought off and they continue in business? What, how do you reward the investors? How does it work in uh, crowdfunding? The, the number one issue in the whole angel capital community globally is what we refer to as exits. How do you exit the business? How do you get out? Um, the general, in the, historically, um, this, the small companies would become large companies and do an initial public offering, and then you have liquidity through a stock exchange. 
Uh, more recently, in the last decade or so, that hasn't been too popular because it's very expensive to go public and it puts you in another business. In addition to selling your products, you're selling your shares and you're constantly dealing with investors, so it can be a bit of a distraction. So the most popular exit path and the way that investors get rewarded is through an M&A transaction. And this is where I work myself closely with a number of, of accountants in my area to help identify those M&A partners, because that will then provide the liquidity to investors. It's very rare, especially in the technology business, for companies to pay dividends to investors. It happens, but it's very, very rare. It's usually more the life, what we call the lifestyle type businesses that become mature that might do that. But usually the, the reward to investors will come through an M&A transaction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nandara Mafai from Uganda. Uh, I have one. We, are, we have all agreed that SMEs are everywhere and are the biggest in every country to develop. I want to give a specific example, maybe to Africa. When an SME go to, goes to the bank to borrow money, they will say you are more risky and the interest rate will be higher. While a, a big company like a multinational will come and the interest rate will be lower. Now, what it means is this means when it borrows at a higher interest rate, which is risky, it means the default rate is high. And these are the most SMEs which go under because they cannot be able to service the loans. Now, I want to learn from you, or oh, and I get advice from you. How best can we help SMEs in these developing countries so that the lenders can understand that the interest rate should be lower to the SMEs and higher for the bigger ones. Thank you. My name is Anwaruddin Chowdhury. I'm from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Bangladesh. Uh, we have had three very explicit presentations in different dimensions. Uh, despite the global acknowledgement that SMEs, the engine of growth, or you know, play a major role in national development process and economic growth of the countries, particularly in the developing world, there is uh, the perennial problem of constraint in access to credit for the SMEs. And I think Kumar Raghu brought out micro and SMEs. So micro SMEs also coming into the scenario now. Uh, we also take on the other side of the picture, developing countries in their perspective plans, as well as donor agencies in the development agenda have among the top priorities financial inclusion of the micro and small enterprises, or in other words, the poor and marginalized people to bring them under the formal ambit of the financial services sector. So how do we blend all these? I think Kumar has given a specific agent of the way forward, which is very relevant. And as far as the accounting profession is concerned, I think the institutes in the respective countries can position themselves to play a proactive role in development of skills for the SMEs to be able to access finance. When you talk of constraints on access to finance, it's uh, the access to information, access to knowledge, access to skill, also embedded therein. So these are the areas where we can play an important role. I think the lady from Australia rightly pointed out the cost of credit. Actually, in our part of the world, there are concessional credits available for SMEs, just as much as for women entrepreneurs. But there is an issue, it's access to information. Shyness, even though micro and small SMEs may have sound business propositions and may prove to be credible borrowers, yet banks are shy to lend to them compared to the corporate sector. So I think this is where the accountants can fill in the gap and develop relevant expertise among the MSMEs to access finance and also can assert the influence upon the lending regulator like the central bank as well as the lending institutions to come forward and lend to them. Okay. Now, say in Bangladesh, the microcredit has taken off very well. So what we are trying to do under UK government DFID funded program is to inspire banks to downscale their lending size and inspire MFIs 
to upscale their lendings to cater to the needs of micro and small enterprises throughout the country. And one area, although we have been talking of more on the internet-based focus, Agwe also export mentioned about uh, linking up with global exports, very relevant. I think one area which has not been covered is to ensure that this access to information or the access to finance is disseminated throughout, for which you need to have a very extensive rural outreach. And in Bangladesh, actually, the market proliferation of the mobile financial services has been very profound compared to the internet applications by the SMEs. So I think maybe it is another area where the lending agencies may be encouraged to go into mobile financial services to offer credits and uh, the M micro and small enterprises would be able to access them more conveniently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gail, yes, go ahead. Just to add to what Mr. Anwar uh, said, uh, one specific, uh, you know, changes that is taking place is that uh, the cooperative societies, cooperative banks. In many developing nations, we have seen that the cooperative societies and the cooperative banks are playing a very important role in funding this, the small and medium enterprises. It, you take the example of India, we have cooperative banks in almost all the states around the country and the cooperative banks, how they look at the projects differently from a bank is that they are able to understand the business better and they're able to fund them at much lower rates. And this is another source of financing wherein the cooperative bank and the cooperative societies are able to fund the small and medium enterprises. Okay. My name is John Levy, I'm from the United States. And my question, and it, it, I actually have a question, um, is uh, having to do with the uh, default rate of small business loans compared to the damage done during the uh, financial crisis, which had nothing to do with small and medium businesses. And my concern is that um, I think the banking industry needs to be aware of the fact that larger risks on smaller amounts are actually better banking than, um, than gigantic failures, <clears throat> even though they're relatively rare. Um, but I'd like to know the numbers as to what, what the, um, what the failure rates are on small businesses, and I would like to be part of the process of trying to help small businesses get more loans so that um, mechanically that would be helping the banks to make better decisions. But what I find is the banks tend to make paranoid decisions and reject essentially almost anything. And it's a, the concern I have is, is that if the banks looked at the real failure rates spread over such a large number of loans, they would make better decisions. Uh, and I'd like to ask the panel what, the, what, the, what their experiences are with regard to the failures of small business loans outside of the crash period, because frankly, most of those failures were a function of the big crash, not a function of the poor business practices of the small businesses. Yeah. A, a, a very good question and a very good point made. Um, clearly the bank's behaviour, as I touched upon in my presentation, has been severely coloured by their experience of the GFC and they, uh, they're clearly beating up the wrong end of town. They've, they've lent money to um, big bankers that have got large degrees of self-interest that had a, a fascination with self-gratification and fell in love with some unsophisticated borrowers and had a hurried love affair and we're all, we're all paying for that essentially. And it does intrigue me that banks then, as the knee-jerk knee reaction that I spoke about from regulators and lenders, have, have taken that out on, on a component of their loan book that really had nothing to do with it. So the banks, unfortunately, deal in margins. They, they don't get any upside. If, if they lend money, like in a crowd funder lends some money, there's some, there's some big upside possibility there. With a bank, if they lend money, their upside is that they get paid their interest rate and make their margin. So they are naturally attracted to big deals and big margins, um, but it's certainly uh, a, a valid uh, observation, and I think, um, certainly in my experience, the default rate uh, from small business, perhaps the default rate is, is, uh, might, might be comparable, because small businesses get into difficulty, but actually, losing money on a small business book um, is not 
as, um, as costly to banks as it is in the, big, in the big business book, because invariably the small business book is covered by, by security and mum and dad, and uh, mum and dad are dealing with their money, they're not dealing with someone else's money, and one of the best tests of um, capacity to borrow is your own individual desperation to pay it back. You know, the last thing you want to do is lose your house, or the last thing you want to do is borrow money that you can't pay back. So the, the individual, lending money to an individual has an inherent safety valve in relation to it. So um, that's a good point. I would, uh, yes. I would fully agree with uh, what our uh, learned friend said. But the only challenge what we find today is the banks, the moment they lend, they forget the customer. I think the bank should get into a constant engagement with the enterprise. They need to understand what are their concerns, try to see if they can help them. Like it is done in uh, a venture capital funding where there's some sort of a support being given. Today what is happening is the banks just lend the money and then they expect uh, the borrowers to file stock statements, they expect the borrowers to file the audited statements. I think s additional handholding is what is required so that, uh, as he rightly said, if the loss is there in a lot of small, uh, small and medium enterprises, the banks would be able to absorb this loss better than one big account failing. Yes, true. Yes. But, but remember that bank, banks are just intermediaries, they're middlemen, right, between the depositors and, and, and the yeah. ones they lend to. And the whole premise of crowdfunding is you can cut out that intermediary Correct. and go directly to a portal. And, and I think we are too worried or reliant on banks, and I think we can do the job ourselves okay. and empower the crowd to do that and take yeah. over that responsibility. Well, well, clearly the crowdfunding is, yeah. is, is now possible through technology, and clearly yeah. it's filling a need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's coming and, and we can't stop it, it's impossible and I think the regulators are slow to catch up but, but they will and, and it'll prevail. The big challenge I might say though in crowdfunding that hasn't been mentioned and I neglected it in my talk is that you know, it's one thing to have it but the real challenge is getting the message out there. You know, it's like putting up a website if you don't have traffic going to it. Um, it doesn't do you any good. Even though it is available to anyone anywhere in the world, you still need a so-called campaign yeah. to promote your company. And that's a big challenge. And again, I think that's where the accounting profession can play a big role in helping to provide very simple, straightforward disclosure documentation so that investors have something that makes sense to them. They can read, make an informed decision as to whether to invest or not. Yeah. But it really will be a challenge to promote. So it's nice to have it, but that's yes. the challenge. It is the challenge indeed. Hello, my name is Kantha Naika. I'm from South Africa. I represent the South African Institute of Professional Accountants. I've got a comment as well as possibly a mini question. I've really enjoyed the discussion because we're, we're really involved in the SMME space as well as uh, in the development of a tool, actually a tool which we have here in, at the World Congress that we're showcasing that looks at access to finance for small businesses. And I think we need to understand as the accounting profession that it's a collaborative uh, approach. I like what Mike said just now. We're relying too much on banks. We've actually got to look at other sources of funding. The Bangladeshi model is one of them. Sabre model in Brazil is, is another. Crowdfunding is one of them as well. If we um, use tools to actually push the agenda, we're going to make the change we want to see. The reality is that as professional accountants, we're in the position to make that change. We advise these guys. We tell them, we mentor them, we support them, we help them with the development of their businesses. So I want to, thank you. <laughs> I, I want to challenge all of you to chat to me and to have a look at the project gallery because we've got a really exciting tool and it uses innovation. Um, Mike would probably recognize some of the tool because it actually sits from a USAID perspective developed over a period of five years on the FSP model in South Africa. So um, it uses a, a, a cloud-based uh, platform to actually collect information from entrepreneurs, match the lenders to the professional organization or the professional person at the back end, which actually then puts three people together to take care of the whole financing uh, uh, model. My, my small question, um, is where do you think we go from here? Because there's been so much talk, and I, I put this to all three of you, or four of you perhaps, is we talk, talk, talk about small business, it's talk shop and we do nothing about it. Shouldn't the challenge be to IFAC and the S&P committee specifically to do something proactively about what we as professionals can do to change the space? 
Gehen wir. <lacht> Okay. Yeah. Go ahead with this. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, it's a very uh, good question to all the panelists. Most of the uh, you know work that has to be done, as I said in my presentation, also small and medium practitioners have a very important role to play in supporting the small and medium enterprises. And I fact the committee on small and medium uh, practitioners is trying to address some of the issues that have been raised. Okay, this is one of the issues There are many, many other issues that are there, but yes, as such, uh, the, I fully agree with you that we have an important role to play as accounting professionals to help the SMEs to move forward. And today with so many options being available in the market, we can innovate products, we can try to steer new things at the uh, policy level and see how best uh, credit is available to the small and medium enterprises. I would agree with your views. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bukia Kemoladun from Nigeria. Um, talking about SMEs, like my predecessor said, been a lot of talk about um, the challenges of um, SMEs, and clearly we all know the roles that SMPs should be playing in the uh, in assisting SMEs. But we also understand that most of the time, the one of the major challenges is that they can't afford the services of professionals, um, SMPs to offer such services that are needed. And you wonder if you want to um, develop something like a business development services, BDS, and um, you wonder who is gonna pay for the services of um, the SMPs in offering the services to the SMEs in getting to where they want to get into. So we, uh, clearly we see that more and more, it's getting more difficult. Even the establishment of some um, Specific agencies, lending agencies to help the SMEs in my own country hasn't really solved that much problem because you find out that they still ask for um, uh, um, collaterals which aren't available for the, with the SMEs because if they had it in the first and they probably would have gone to the bank. Apart from reduced lending rates, you know, all the other challenges are still there and so they can't afford it. So I'm looking at bringing two different people together. You have the lenders who normally probably don't want to take their money to the bank, to the banks because they get lower investment uh, returns, lower rates of returns on their investment, although lower risks, but you know, being able to afford the SMEs as well, but they also want to have a, a kind of guarantee of their, of their returns. So you're looking at, critically, you're looking at um, the areas of trust, you know, from both ends. So you're looking at um, SMP being in the gap in the middle, you know, and uh, you're looking at, I'm trying to see if we can have a kind of a collection of lenders and um, who sponsors the SMPs to kind of provide management services, yeah. consultancy services to the SMEs to move them forward. Otherwise, we keep talking and talking and then we have no results. If we don't have something clearly in mind, a pool of investors who are risk takers, maybe you call them angel investors, and who clearly goes out to fund such SMEs, you know, working together with um, SMPs. Thank you. Go ahead, Kumar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, small and medium SMEs are generally cost conscious. I fully agree with you that when they're looking at professional support, when they're looking at uh, support from you, consulting services from you, they're quite uh, careful whether you'll be able to provide the right kind of value. But what is very important for us as accounting professionals or as SMPs, we need to showcase to them the value add you can bring to the table. Many a time, the small SME feels that you are just a, a provider of audit and assurance services. Maybe you can go a step forward and tell him that yes, in addition, in addition to audit and assurance, I could also provide you these services. And if you can tell him on the table the value add you can bring him, I'm sure he'll be ready to pay. Because what an SME looks at is a value-added service from you. And if you are able to showcase to him, I'm sure he'll be able to pay you whatever fees you would charge. Thank you, Kumar. Uh, one final question. We're, we're running out of time now, so go ahead. Thank you. My name is Edugum Hansen from Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Um, I work a lot with SMEs in Nigeria, and um, it's the same challenge we've been talking about as regards financing. Of, and of course, management is also a part of it. I want to shift the focus a bit from SMEs. 
we've talked a, bit about, a lot about how banks can finance or having challenges with financing SMEs. But now let's also think about it from this perspective. Banks are a profit-making organization, and so their aim is profit maximization, and also looking at ways to ensure that they reduce their risk um, portfolio. They, they, they also do not have um, high operational cost in financing SMEs because, because of the volume mm -hmm. and then the, the little amount spread across a number of SMEs. The operational cost is also very high. Now, I've worked with SMEs, I work with SMEs, the challenges are the same. What can the banks, what can we do to help the banks? What can be done to help the banks come out of this challenge? Rather than always talking about what the banks are not doing, what can we do differently as professional accountants? What can the government do? What can somebody out there do for the banks to come out of this challenge and work with SMEs in a better way? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Well, you get Mark. You could, uh, once you um, introduce a competitive element, maybe the banks will um, uh, wake up to the opportunities. And what I see happening in a lot of uh, communities now and in angel organizations, for example, is the creation of funds. So when you create a fund, you're essentially becoming a banker. And um, in the communities where I've seen these funds being created, the banks are more willing to work with those funds because it's a question of risk mitigation. And uh, it's also a good way to get the crowd involved in a fund because it speaks to those failure rates. So if you have a capital pool, um, I've created three funds myself in the last uh, decade, um, and they're doing quite well in spite of the high failure rates. So there's a good payback to the investors. The banks are looking at these funds, and the banks are starting to co-invest with us in these funds because they see more professionalism, they see uh, less risk, and they see a pool at work. And so I think, you know, banks and others always respond when there's a bit of competitive yes. pressure, yeah. and I think we could do that. Yeah. 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 The, the, the new horizon is that we're now dealing with lots of young people in many instances that have got nothing but a skateboard and a baseball cap <laughs> and uh, no house. So, so there's a, a whole new market there for banks and they haven't been able to deal with that yeah. in the past. So crowdfunding and, and online reputations and, and um, lending money to businesses with intangible assets that can actually be exceedingly successful yeah. Is, is the new paradigm, and uh, we need to get used to that as, as advisors and the finance industry need to get used to it as well. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, SME finance and where that's going is obviously a key topic that has um, raised a lot of passions in the room today and a lot of questions. Uh, thank you very much, audience, for your participation, and I'd like to thank our panel, Mike Volker, Graeme Wade, and Kumar Raghu. Thank you. Thank you.